Hi, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thrilled to be here today to talk about OpenZD with the help of Ziggy down here, who says hello as well. Let's dive in by first ensuring that this is worth your time. <laughs> Let's talk about who cares and who doesn't care. And if you don't care, feel free to leave. So two quick words. Number one, Ziggy over here as a chef would say, he cares, you care, I care, because the ability to cook without a recipe, right? To be a chef who is innovating and iterating to create some mix of art and science. Much of this obviously is the power of open source and open ZD, which we will be talking about is exactly that. Slightly more specifically, it's using open source to solve sticky, secure networking problems. Kind of interesting in that because the open source takes what used to be a pretty closed proprietary island type domain and turn it into programmable software. All of a sudden, groups who weren't necessarily all cooking together in the kitchen now are, meaning that if you are a developer, an architect, a security expert, an ops engineer, you may care. If the open source stream doesn't resonate with you, if you are not one of these type of people, then you may want to exit. Now, if you're still with me, I'll go one step further. These are the type of use cases that folks often care about. And Ziggy, just like the rest of us, often fights fires. And this is kind of like the, where are the fires that you can use OpenZD to help extinguish or maybe more accurately prevent from <laughs> starting in the first place. Uh, now, obviously, open palette, open template, because it's open source, you can use OpenZD in a variety of ways, which we'll talk about. But these are just three of the areas where we see folks have a lot of fires and use OpenZD very effectively to combat and then ultimately prevent. The logos you see here are just several of the public examples, and you can click on the logos in the deck to read more about the use case that you may care about. Okay, so you're still with me after the who cares, who doesn't care. Quick context on the high level before we dive in. This is a little bit of an eye-opening statistic, I think it was to me. I, even being in this industry for 20 odd years, when you look at cybercrime effectively doubling in the span of a couple of years, and, and we're not starting from small numbers and doubling, right? We're talking about now exceeding over a trillion dollars. And that might be conservative. It's a bit hard to measure the impact of a business that might be brought to its knees in the face of a cyber attack. And obviously, I think, unfortunately, 2021 showed us this quite a bit with several high profile attacks, not the least of which was Colonial Pipeline and the ransomware attacks, Kasaya, and just last month, Log4j. One interesting observation, also a little bit eye opening to me. The number one initial attack vector now is essentially taking advantage of basic TCP IP network architecture, scanning networks that are inherently open and insecure, and then exploiting them. This is not a surprise to those of us in the space, but it's a powerful statistic because usually what is number one on these threat indexes is things like human factors engineering. Phishing, for example, which we all know is, is very, very difficult to combat. 
I believe 2021 was probably the first year that this vector taking advantage of the inherent vulnerabilities of, of networking actually rose, so to speak, to the top of the list. 2021, as I mentioned, showed us this to a great degree. If we go one step deeper, and I'm going to dive into OpenZD here in a second, just to make sure we all see the big picture, though. Part of the, let's say, reaction to the 2021 attacks was like this, oh, yeah, well, of course, VPN, SD-WAN, firewalls, bolted-on security, they're insufficient. They're not enough. We need more. We need things like zero trust. Right? I didn't hear even up to the president of the United States, Joe Biden, saying we need zero trust uh, X number of times in, in the spring type time frame. Well, the elephant in the room, so to speak, is the connections below the waterline. So most of the zero trust is focused on user to application, like up here, the top of this iceberg. In reality, the worst of these 2021 attacks, they attacked under the water, so to speak. They attacked all of the other connections that maybe we don't think about as much. So in other words, if you were fairly progressive and you've kind of protected your user to server, app server, web server, API server, et cetera, connections with quote unquote zero trust and you're proxying all those connections through some provider cloud, terrific. It's just that it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Because under the water, as you know, there are many, many other connections. And these connections are not proxied through the zero trust provider clouds for a variety of reasons, whether it's protocol limitations, security posture performance, or otherwise. This, under the water, is what gets attacked, usually because it's the kind of most difficult thing to bolt on security, to add agents, for example, to do DNS CMAME-based redirects, to proxy it through the zero trust provider cloud, have them decrypt it, re-encrypt it, send it back. It's difficult under the water. You need an entirely different approach, an entirely different architecture, right? And here's where Ziggy starts rocking and rolling, as you see in the upper left here. Because Ziggy and OpenZD, they operate at the application level. They really could care less what A and B is in this diagram. It is going to secure everything by design, give you the controls to do it as software. All right, what does that mean? How does that work? Let me jump in. Number one, if you're going to be secure by design, including under that waterline, then you have to be everywhere. And these are just a, a fairly simplified diagram. What you see here is the ZD endpoints. In some ways, these are routers like network stacks that you control from the cloud and enable you to extend secure networking literally everywhere. At one extreme, these endpoints can be compiled into your application as code such that when you deploy your application, the ZD endpoint goes with it. That means you don't need to, for example, deploy an agent, a separate agent on a device that hey, you might not control, you might not be able to, or it might not make sense to put that agent on. Uh, same thing for things like IoT, APIs, remote management. You can put ZD anywhere into your application, as mentioned, as a container, as a VM. There's pre-built versions for every major OS, et cetera. So first things first, get endpoints, get them everywhere, and obviously be able to do this in a very quick, cloud orchestrated programmable manner. Number two, the endpoints are interesting, but then they kind of quickly run into a second problem, which is identity, like IP address. No, thank you. We need identity, as in X509 certificates, 
bi-directional authentication of both the endpoint and the cloud controllers, which is what you see here. Obviously, none of us want to manage this infrastructure. We need like a bootstrap system. We don't want to get into PKI business. OpenZD takes care of that so that when you deploy these endpoints, again, no matter where they are inside the app, a container of VM, the bootstrapped X509 certificate-based bidirectional authentication goes right along with it. Great, two steps. Step number three, authentication using that identity. Obviously, well, not obviously, because we haven't talked about it. So we're going to see a network here in a second, programmable network built on ZD routers. That network doesn't exist. It can't be seen. It can't be reached unless you have properly authenticated with these X509 identities. To go a step further, you identify yourself, you authenticate, terrific. Now the question is, well, do you have authorization to consume whatever resource you're trying to consume? Do you have authorization to use a particular API to reach a certain microservice, to use a particular application? And obviously you can extend that authorization via the ZD policy engine to be based on any number of variables, the posture of the device, location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is all kind of built into the OpenZD platform. Now, those four steps in of themselves are incredibly important because they reverse the networking paradigm, right? Instead of connecting at layer three and then doing identification authentication authorization, which leads to the scan exploit stuff that we talked about earlier. If you think about it, what you've now done is reversed it. You said, no, no, no. I'm going to identify, authenticate, authorize before I have access to a network. And then once I have access to that network, it's gonna be least privileged access based on those policies. So the network we're talking about here is an overlay, meaning you put it on top of any underlay network, set of clouds, set of edges, et cetera, et cetera. You use these routers to do so. These are ZD routers. You probably wouldn't be surprised at this point to learn that these routers do the same type of authentication authorization as everything else. They're pure software, they're ZD software, open source like everything else. They are spun up and down on demand according to your business logic. This means not only can they go anywhere, uh, which is obviously important, they can also be ephemeral. You can spin them up and down depending on if you need them or not. Or if you have certain security requirements, you may periodically spin them up and down to kind of create a, a moving target, if you will. So. Quick recap, endpoint here, endpoint here, they need to talk to each other. After we do proper identification, authentication, authorization of everything involved, then we're gonna be able to create this overlay. Now, what's interesting here, I'm gonna cover two things. One, I, I kind of skipped this, right? So these, these routers are also follow the same policies, least privilege access as anything else. So like in this example, this top right router, I don't know what sin he committed, but he's not eligible for this particular session. He may be in your ZD network, but is not used for this particular session. Remember, everything is application specific, session specific. So that's why the red line there. The orange line, this router is authenticated, authorized for potential use of this session. However, usually for reasons like availability, latency, jitter, packet loss, this router is not chosen for that particular session. So it skips this router with the orange connectivity and it uses these two routers. Uh, and by the way, it could just use one router, it could use three routers, it could use four routers. The algorithms, the dynamic routing lives on these edges. So your ZD endpoints, regardless if you put them into your application or, or deploy them as a separate container VM, they have the ability to look at the various paths available and pick a path according to your policies. Now your policies might be geofencing or they might be 
minimize latency, jitter, packet loss, whatever those policies are. You might want to keep all the routers in a specific cloud. It doesn't matter, right? That's 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 your policy. Now, obviously, the more ASs you have these routers deployed on, the more diversity of path selection, the better chance of finding a really good route. And so what we've done is go ahead and built these ZD routers for every major cloud environment. So they sit out on the marketplaces and you can spin them up and down on demand. You put them right into your Jenkins, Ansible, Terraform, et cetera, and build on the fly, potentially, a global network that goes across all of the hyperscale cloud providers, giving you maximum resiliency. As you see here, the connections are outbound only from the perspective of both these endpoints. This is incredibly important when we relate back to the scan and exploit, right? What it means is these endpoints are dark to the outside world, right? They close, if, it's a, if this is on a database, close the link listeners. If there's a firewall in front of this one, close the inbound firewall ports. There is no need anymore for inbound connectivity. And that of course is our greatest threat. Number one, literally, as we saw earlier on, on the IBM report. So these, both sides of these become dark. They open up outbound only connections. And again, they only open the connections to identified authenticated authorized routers per session or per application. So this, when you put the whole picture together, you quickly see how this reverses the network paradigm, both from a security perspective, but also from a programmability perspective, because everything I just described has nothing to do with hardware. It's all open source. It's all built to be programmable. It's all API first. It's built to be part of whatever ecosystem you need it to be a part of. And because it goes everywhere and it's doing security proactively, meaning saying, you know, let's not build networks and then put the application on the network, an inherently insecure network. Let's instead essentially put the network into the application uh, and let's go all the way up to layer seven from identity, identity authentication authorization perspective before I actually spin up the, the layer three connectivity for these packets to flow. Okay, now the question that usually comes up as well, why isn't this everywhere? I, there's two reasons, right? And Ziggy, uh, Ziggy loves the slide you can see, right? Number one, no one has done this with open source. If you do this with closed source, then there's only so far that you're going to go. Uh, and I'm not by any means belittling any type of closed source approach. Uh, they have their time and day in place. However, there is no prior to us open ZD platform out there. Now there is. Not only is it open source, it does a whole bunch of really complicated things in order to provide this secure by design, programmable, software only, cloud orchestrated type approach that I just mentioned. So like, and these are just six simple modules, right? But any of these modules in of themselves like are really, really, really complex, uh, especially at scale. So we've put a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears, and awesome, awesome developers to create, you know, what we often say is a platform built by developers for developers and it's open source so it will continue to be extended over time next part here and i'm almost done by the way <laughs> i also get the question like okay like i'd love to kind of go towards this north star that you're describing i'd love the zd endpoints everywhere i'd like to just completely eliminate my wan my mpls dependencies my underlay network dependencies um, some people because they want to eliminate it completely, others because they want to like create the overlay, make everything secure, and then go back and swap out the underlay. Uh, 
et cetera. It's a, it's a North Star. A lot of us, a lot of folks are starting without even necessarily knowing what's on our networks today or what should be on our networks today. And that can be a little bit intimidating. What's interesting though, because everything I just described is application specific, because it's all open source programmable software only called orchestrated, you can start with one particular use case. These are the same ones we saw before, right? The, the ones where there's usually some type of fire burning. And you can start with that use case without a forklift, without upsetting the apple cart, without touching <laughs> other things, right? You're creating a secure overlay for that specific use case. And then you can take it from there. Finally, the last use case is this blank one here, right? And you see ZD the chef in there because the reality here with the open source, start anywhere. Start where it makes sense. It could be something on your home network. <laughs> it could be something that doesn't exist. It could be some use case we haven't imagined. In fact, in our journey so far, what we've seen is folks are innovating in ways that we never imagined, which was exactly our goal. We want to enable that type of innovation, and there's no other open source out there that does. And so that is extraordinarily exciting to us. Um, so all that to say is, hey, you have a use case where your hair is on fire or someone's hair is on fire, and you want to use ZD over there, go ahead and do it. Um, but you just want to start cooking something, you, know, you might not even know what, what it might end up looking like, go get started. You can go right up to the GitHub. Uh, we also have some quick starts here that you can see. You can also talk to the community um, over at this course. However you want to get started, we look forward, we greatly look forward to seeing what you might build with OpenZD.